All right, welcome everybody. We'll be starting in about 30 seconds. We'll give uh, the last few attendees a chance to log in. Okay, welcome everybody to Tips, Tricks, and Methods for Industrial Data Logging. My name is Sean Kelly. I am uh, an Account Development Manager here at Onset. Uh, this presentation will be uh, presented by Kevin Vidmar of Loraro uh, Energy Services. We can go to the next slide there. Uh, it will be recorded, so you will have the ability to see it afterwards. Um, Go ahead. Uh, Q and A. Feel free to type in any questions on the side, over to the right-hand side. We will address as many as we possibly can during the presentation. Any that we can't, we will follow up with you and uh, make sure that your questions are answered. Company overview. Onset is uh, actually based on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Uh, we have been developing manufacturing. Data logger since 1981, and we are a global leader in data logging. And without further ado, uh, welcome Kevin. Well, thank you very much. Welcome. Anyway, uh, welcome everybody, and we're going to talk about um, considerations and tricks and things that we've learned for the industrial environment over the years. Um, it's almost obligatory. You got to say who you're with. So here it is, the 30 second. Um, I'm with Larero, that's like Sombrero, only spelled different, Larero Engineering Associates. And uh, we've got a bunch of offices, we're expanding our offices, a bunch of people, see 170, probably about 20 or so uh, that are PEs. We do a lot of different things you see there, uh, including some of the hardcore um, uh, energy work and industrial and engineering work. And we're one of those companies that uh, are employee-owned, so that means everybody knows what I'm doing today, so I better do good. And this is me, uh, a little bit of background. Um, I'm running the, the energy services, been around 35 years uh, in industry. Um, and um, so a lot of years before consulting in industry, and then we've worked a lot with industry, been over 500 sites for energy support in various ways. And I won't tell you exactly how many, because if I reach a certain target, I'm going to retire. Anyway, so wide-ranging experience. Um, and this gets into the manufacturing side. It was all these things within manufacturing. So you see a lot of things, and you look at things differently when you're all these things. And then you see that um, I'm a certified energy manager, certified energy auditor, certified carbon reduction manager, whatever. And there's my email if you need to reach me. Uh, so, just real quick, what are the objectives for data logging? And we always want to start with what are we trying to do so we can make sure that we're doing it at the end. We want to know the amount of energy used, the amount, how much energy is being used, but we also want to know the time of use. So it's not just we, we use this amount, we can use it within one hour, or we can use it over 24 hours. We want to know that. We want to probably know process performance. Is the process, especially an industrial process, meeting what it's supposed to? And we want to, as part of data logging, think about from all this, can we get efficiency improvements out of this? And with the amount of use, the time of use, and process performance, we can start to define non-value add. That's a big word in any organization but especially within industry, there's value add, non-value add. Value add changes the form, fit, or function of the part. Non-value add does not do that, and you want to eliminate that. And you also, probably with data log, you want to determine your before and after conditions. Here's the case before, the compressor's running like this. Here's the case of the compressor's afterward, measurement and verification. 
and you really want to get into actual savings, you cannot have a value discussion until you have a value. That's what I'm referring to there. And so from all this, you'll probably, M&B, you'll generate some metrics. So let's keep all these thoughts in mind as we go through the next slides. So what do we want to do? We want to talk about how to use data logging and some of the considerations more than what to use. When I say the what, I'm saying I'm not going to go into what's an analog, a digital, wireless, um, all those various technologies of loggers to accomplish the same thing, time of use, amount of use, whatever. And so by doing it generically like this, the comments we're going to bring up can apply to any logging situation. So we're going to cover those considerations for more efficiency with your logging, especially in an industrial environment. And we want to make sure that we're able to deliver the value to the customer. What are they paying for? They're getting it. And I tell you, I, you know, that, that phrase, we've all heard it. We just have to keep applying it. Common sense is not that common. We got to consider that, especially in an industrial environment where a fork truck can hit something, people can hit it, you might have uh, wet processes, dry processes, whatever. You got to apply common sense systematically. So, what's different in an industrial environment? It's loud. So, you know, maybe we're not talking about, you know, OSHA, you know, PPE here for ears and stuff, but it's loud. So you got to understand that a lot of industry has process critical specification. Process has to reach blank temp and stay there or whatever. But industry is definitely typically dirtier unless you're getting into some of the light manufacturing or clean applications or maybe high tech. It can often be both hotter and colder. Hotter where you're working with a production kiln in an area, colder where you're working with the warehouse on that same building. And it can be varied. You can have shop offices, you need to do something there. Their own separate HVAC systems, what should you consider? Metrology rooms, measurement rooms. Things need to be very precise and very controlled there, very different. And then you have production areas. Like I said, you might have a kiln, a press room, whatever, warehousing, and you might have inspection, all of which have different considerations. And you gotta consider all that before you start logging, either placing the loggers or using them. So, quick definition. What is data logging? It can all start with a snapshot. You can take your temperature outside your window every day and just write it down, 7 a.m., the temperature is blank. So in an industrial environment, maybe you do it, this snapshot, as I'm saying, with a multimeter, the top photo, or maybe a thermometer or you name it. But at some point, you want to get those values over time, whether it's for a day, a weekend, or a week or a month. What's the average daily temperature for the month? So that's what we're trying to get at. Values over differing conditions, different times. And this usually leads to we're getting into the auditing entry level two, three, whatever. Now, a lot of times in industry, we will measure current. In fact, we were talking with um, the onset people just before this about some of the CTs that are used and so on. But measuring current does not account for voltage. So when you're in an industrial environment, you, can, you should take voltage of things. I find many things running hot. And if they're running hot, that's different than running cold. But you want to know that. You can change your results 5%, 10%. Notice here it's at 491. That's the voltage for this piece of equipment. Um, I have seen volts as high as 500 for a 480 circuit. So there's problems with just taking the current. So let's keep that in mind in the industrial environment. In the home environment, doesn't matter. In a multifamily, probably doesn't matter. In industry, it can have a big play. And the other thing that measuring current does is it doesn't account for power factor and that can change, and I'll show you some examples later on. So, we think you should take a multimeter reading. Before you put on a CT, current transformer, anything, you should do that. Safety. Why? Safety, safety, safety. 
what is the arc flash category of that panel or that shut off or whatever? And based on that, what's the arc flash zone you should stand back from if you're not actually adding the data logger? If you're adding the data logging uh, to the equipment, what is the arc flash clothing, the suit, whatever you need to wear? So please think safety. We're going to come back to safety many times because we're dealing with electricity in the industrial environment at high voltages, which can kill very quickly. So you certainly want to get the voltage. The other reason you want to take a multimeter is probably to get the right current transformer for the job. There's, for example, we were just talking about zero to 200 versus zero to 600. If you're putting on a zero to 200 and the amperage is 250, you've got the wrong current transformer. You're not going to get your, your value. Take the multimeter reading. And for example, on large motors, you might have two wires. So you need to understand that each wire is taking half the amperage and so on. And you have to understand that and factor that in your data logging and analysis. So as we talk about safety, again, um, follow all your OSHA rules. Whatever the site defined OSHA rules are in an industrial environment, you follow them. Every site can be different with quote, those rules. So whatever they are, make sure you follow them and at, at least follow those. Um, only qualified persons are allowed to perform certain functions, testing, putting things on. And you can see, so the, the guy in the bottom right hand, he's putting something on, he's wearing certain equipment based on the category. If you look in the photo above it, it says category one. So based on the category, you wear certain clothing when you do certain things. Please don't wear jewelry or metal. I mean, even a pen in your pocket, you shouldn't have that. No earrings, no wedding rings, you name it. At least use insulated gloves to take these sort of multimeter readings or even putting CTs on it, at least. And there's a National Fire Protection Association 70E rules. You should follow those as well. So this is kind of like a checklist as we're in the industrial environment, some of the safety considerations you ought to have. Now, that's putting things on the panel or on the disconnects, you name it. There's non-invasive logging and, and there's logging where you got to look at the equipment, you got to say, what's the guarding of that equipment? This photo is showing an example of light curtains, which are all the way around this equipment. And if you're going to put some data loggers on the motor for the, 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 the take up, which is the round thing where the coil is going on, um, if you're going to put some motors on that, you got to make sure that the light curtains are not going to be um, cut. That you're, If you walk into there when those are on, the process is going to stop. People get mad at you when processes stop. You got to factor that in. What's the guarding? Is there a guard on the motor? We got to take it off carefully. Maybe you got to shut the machine down. That's preferable to doing anything hot, live, turning, you name it. Everybody knows, um, you know, the sort of data loggers we'll be talking about that, that can happen. Just measuring kilowatts or the usage of the kilowatts, that's kilowatt hours, state. Whether the motor's on off, that's the logger in the top left photo. That's just one of the motor on offs on a piece of equipment. Um, you can have the contact closures. You can use loggers to tell you that. Lighting, whether it's light level, lighting on off, occupancy, temp, you name it. We all know that there's plenty of data loggers out there to do the job. We'll walk through some of the considerations behind some of these. So we've got some stuff that we want to get time of use and amount of use. Now we have to place the logger. And we should really think about how we're going to do this. Safety. How are we going to place it? Are we going to get on a chair to place the, the logger like you see this gentleman doing to put it high up on a cement column? Are we going to get a chair or are we going to get a ship's ladder or something to do it safely? Um, take a photo of the placement before and after. Again, some defense sites 
Other sites, you're not allowed to do that. That's life. You have to take even better notes. But always take a photo so you have proof of placement that if the logger leaves, you've got proof of that. Whenever you can, if you can hide the logger so that it doesn't have to be out in plain sight and it doesn't have to be available for being hit by anything, struck by, pilfered, you name it, hide it. Uh, we like to hide them inside cabinets as appropriate. Again, if there's room in the cabinet, most cabinets have room at least for one of the uh, onset data loggers. I like to make them hard to reach, so you got to be like, you know, a Goliath to be able to take it down. But you certainly want it near the monitored condition. You don't want it too far away and so on. When things are too far away and there's a wire going all that distance, things happen to that wire. You want to tell people about, we'll talk about that a little more in a, in a minute. Um, make sure people know that these data loggers, even the one that's on the thermostat below, is not a camera. People think it's a camera. It's watching them work. It's keeping track of their productivity in a manufacturing environment. Make sure they know it's not a camera. And when I say be careful about technical types, some people just anything new in a manufacturing environment, especially if it's a high-tech environment, um, they might take the logger and actually take it to their workbench, which has happened to us, and they take it apart just to see the circuitry and what's inside of it. Then they try to reassemble it, and it's not working, obviously. Didn't collect the data. So that's why we might hide it. That's where you have to know your audience. Um, if it's in a press room, where everybody's just be dealing with steel and, and press oil and so on, that's different than dealing in a high-tech clean room. And you really want to identify each logger, and we're going to talk about that even more as well. So tip, tell people almost exactly what you are doing. Why almost? Well, the number one thing you want out of logging is you do not want people to change their behavior. So if you, say, if you say to somebody, yeah, I'm putting this log around the wall so that I can see when you shut the lights off or when you're in the room, every time they see that light switch, whatever, they might think of that. So tell them what you're doing to a point. We've, we've done this where we said, hey, this logger, the light logger with the lens on the front, it's measuring light quality versus occupancy and light on off. Maybe we, we, we want to tell people if, if there's, if it's, out of the way, they can't take it down, whatever, but we really want to make sure they don't change behavior. So remember, loggers with lenses, and everybody knows what a lens is from seeing, you know, light switches with lenses for occupancy and so on. They're not cameras. Remind people that loggers are expensive. You take it, you break it, you bought it, you got to charge it to the job. So another thing that you've got to consider is how are you going to mount the logger? So we know where we're going to put it. We're going to put it high up, um, but we have to mount it on the wall. We're going to put it inside this cabinet, but we can't put it just laying down on the bottom. We've got to mount it on the side of the cabinet, whatever. So think of how you're going to mount it early on. Adhesives. Some loggers come with these, and you've seen where you can put the adhesive, and it's got Velcro on one side, and you put it on the wall on the other side, command strips, whatever. They don't work as well in an industrial environment, primarily because of dirt, but it could be because of vibration. So you just gotta remember that. Don't count on it to the same degree in a press room that's staying on the wall as you might in an assembly area. And many of these loggers, like the onset logger at the top there, have magnets on the back, which works very well in certain applications. If it's a plastic cabinet or whatever, or if it's coated in certain ways, if it's stainless steel, if it's aluminum, the magnets will not work. you got to think of that up front. So be ready for all this before you go into an industrial environment. So maybe you have to use Velcro, zip ties, other ties, screws, whatever it is, think of that and have that available. You might have to be creative, but... If, as you're doing these things, remember whatever you put up, you got to take down. And you do not want to pull paint off a wall. You do not want to make anything that's visibly different 
after you've taken the logger down, because you might have to touch up the paint, do whatever. Uh, so just be careful. Whatever you put up, you got to take down. And I get this question a lot. Will the logger still work if the liquid crystal display, the LCD, is broken? And the answer is yes. It'll probably get the data. You just won't be able to tell that it's getting the data. But double check that logger, triple check that logger, because you will not have any other feedback system. So this is primarily for me and people of my experienced generation. Every data logger has a small, and I mean small, serial number on the back of it. But the experience, those mature people like me, I can't read that anymore, not without cheaters, and I don't always have cheaters with me. So consider identifying some way the logger with a number on the front, maybe you put a piece of tape, you put a number on that tape so you can pull it off, or maybe you put it permanent, like on this logger, and what it allows for is a stronger photo record. Logger one, I know exactly what it is, and it's in this area, and so on. So whatever works well, make sure you keep really good records, and I like having the loggers identified in addition to serial number. So one of the things you've got to figure out with logging is what is going to be our start and stop times for the loggers and how we're going to do that. Now, sometimes you want a specific date and time. Start at a certain times, Sunday night at midnight when the process starts. And you want to use that when that starting time is important. You may not be there. Why did I say Sunday night? Often we're there in a factory on a Sunday afternoon. They're not working, so we're seeing kind of the sleeping plant. And then, but the process starts at one o'clock in the morning. We'll put a data logger up so it starts at midnight, so we capture whenever in that hour they might start the process and so on. So specific date and time works really well when you're tying loggers between equipment, and you it's easier to merge the data set if it's got the same data and timing and so on. Um, the problem with setting a date and time is sometimes you're unable to get to the process before it actually starts. So just got to be aware of that. If it's three in the afternoon, you're Putting the logger up at four in the afternoon, the process doesn't start till midnight, you're okay. But if it's tighter than that, you might have an issue. You can also do the push part and start, start and stop. And that makes sense when you want to eliminate data tables. I'll show you in a minute. And it's convenient. You just start the logger, you take it out to the spot, you say, ah, here's a good spot. You start it right then and there. The point is you want to think about this critically for every application. Here's the data tales example I was referring to. I started a logger. I was just going to walk out the door from where my computer was and put it in a process room. And somebody stopped me. I put it in my pocket. We talked. And I had it in my pocket. And you can see the black line. That's the temperature. So the temperature says it was 84. And then when it got to the space, finally, a few minutes later, immediately went down to 72 to 70 and so on. But if you look at the statistics on the logger, if you do that, it'll say the maximum temp was 84. That's the data tail. That's not accurate, all because I started it inappropriately at that time. So we're going to want to measure some stuff. And here's what we got to figure out. Begin with the end in mind. What do I mean? Know your equations and your unknowns. Are you just needing amperage, or do you also need power factor? Should you get voltage? Are you going to measure voltage continuously, or just multimeter right up front? What do you want? Hours of use so you can generate energy calculations. What is it you want? So you got to do your data logging to get the best identification of your unknowns. And notice my little question there. Do you need power factor? That's a great question. And for many data logging things, you don't need it because you're not changing a lot. No, no real motor loading changes or no real torque changes or whatever. But you got to think of that. And I'll go through real examples in a second. So power factor. The more unloaded a motor, the less efficient the motor becomes and the lower the power factor. 
Now that is in general, um, and that's especially this power factor becomes really important if the motor is less than 50% loaded. It's got a certain torque, or it's got a certain horsepower, and it's really only doing half the work that it's rated for. If load changes over time, take a compressor that's fully loaded and then it's running unloaded, um, you need to data log differently to be able to capture those two differences there. And as a, as a motor gets smaller, these curves that you see on this slide get really important. The one horse, the five horse, the 10 horse motors, these can have huge changes in power factor and efficiency as the motor becomes unloaded. 100 horse motor, probably not as much. Here's a real example of why you need to be careful about this in an industrial environment. This is a fluke true power meter measuring three phases, three voltages, three amperages, so you can get true power factor and so on. And on the left is a small air compressor that is fully loaded. You can see the kilowatts, KVA, and power factor. Power factor around 0.69, let's say. And then on the right is that same air compressor 30 seconds later when it's unloaded. And the motor is now turning the same speed, but it's not doing as much work. And you can see the power factor changing tremendously, 0.39 to maybe 0.4. So we've gone from almost 0.7 to 0.4. If we would have taken the kilowatt data and applied the same 0.7 power factor between the two, we would have gotten a very wrong answer. So we just really need to consider, is the motor load changing? We might want to address power factor differently in our calculations. Very important consideration for things that, like I said, the motor becomes unloaded. So. We want to make sure you use the right logger. And this is where I'm just saying, before you head out uh, and stick the loggers up, maybe you do something first going around saying, all right, this is what I want here. To do this, I need logger A and B. So what is the objective? Do we want lighting on and off, like the logger at the top there on the top right, um, which will also give us occupancy of the space, space? Or do we want light level? So the top one's gonna to give us on off and occupancy. The one at the bottom on the left, that it will give us light level. You can see where we put it uh, in the, the other photo on the bottom left, right on top of this little cabinet. And then on the bottom on the right is the graph of the light level, which shows natural light level through the day. And then at night, it's when it plateaus and it kind of stays at a um, uh, 600 lux level. So if you want on off and occupancy and light level, you gotta have two loggers to get all that. And that's the, probably the right way to approach many spaces if you're looking to do um, advanced controls on some LED lighting or whatever. These will give you all the variables that you can play with to see what the advanced controls might save you. All right, so we want to make sure we have the right current transformer. We did a multimeter reading to figure that out. We want to make sure we're getting the objectives, starting it the right way to get what we need. But now, how long do we need the data log? And you got to really consider what the, the, the process, the manufacturing process is telling you how long does it operate, 24-7, six days a week, seven days a week, whatever. The longer the logging interval, the longer the logger can do the job, but sometimes you want data very often. Why? If the load is changing a lot, and, and it can be very variable, that's a variable twice, all right, um, you really want more data more often. 10 second interval, maybe even every second, not every minute, not every five minutes. So how do you do that? Anybody that's done data logging understands that the more data you get, the less or the, the, the shorter the logging interval can be. So if you want it every second, you might be able to get only two days. 
If you want it every 10 seconds, you can get it for a week, whatever. So you really got to think of that. And what I suggest is you consider, especially for a manufacturing environment, is you buy extended memory on your loggers. Avoid the problem. It's worth the extra money. That's all I'm saying. And again, it really matters if the motor is changing a lot with its load, if it's constant, or if it's changing. If it's constant, maybe all you need is every 30 seconds. If the motor um, is constant, maybe you only need a motor on off. You don't even need to put a, um, a current transformer on. So this gets to be very important in examples like this. This could be an air compressor. This could be um, uh, chillers, reciprocating chillers um, that stage on uh, HVAC equipment. But if you're taking data every minute, you would not see these loading cycles where the, the, the amperage goes up to well over 160 for a short period of time before the compressor unloads and runs at about 60 amps. If you took the data every minute or every five minutes, you would miss all these changes. And you just need to know that. So how long do we really need to get time of use and amount of use? Too short is probably a problem. Too short says we're doing shortcuts. Um, and you, you really want to be careful with that. Um, Think about what you're trying to prove. Keep it on until you prove that. Now, is there a difference between processes that are feeding something? You get a piece of equipment, you get two things feeding it. If both are running, this thing that is being fed will have a different energy use than if only one's running. Um, maybe if there's a difference by cycle, by shift, shift changes. Third shift, I hate to say this, depending on the equipment, the automation, can be very different than first shift and so on. So you really got to think of how long. Don't make it too short, but you do not want paralysis analysis. You don't want to make it too long, so you just, you're waiting forever, and then you get too much data, and two days of data would have told you the same thing. Maybe by getting a whole week, you validated that it doesn't change over the week, but maybe two days is all you really needed. So this question of how long gets to be, um, you got to think about the process. Now this is, happens to be a um, electric oven and we can see that we're getting all three phases, uh, current, all three phases voltage. So we're figuring out the true uh, power, true energy use. And what we wanted was to capture a full machine cycle. So if you stuck this on for just a few hours, you would get one view. Let's say if you look at the graph on the bottom, furnace is idling at 1600F, you get one view of energy use. Then the furnace is opened, you have no energy use, or it's turned off. Um, then the furnace is brought up to temp. If you just monitored that period, you'd get a different energy use. Then product is put in, and it takes a lot to bring that product to temp. You get a different energy profile and so on. So make sure you get all the machine conditions possible. The heat up cycle, the cool down, all the shifts, you name it. We have a question of uh, how small of an interval would you use for data logging? And as I tried to kind of say, it, it depends on the process and, uh, and the memory of the logger. Uh, if you've got a really good memory logger, it's extended memory, it'll last a long time, I would tend to go with a shorter interval instead of a longer interval, especially if the motor goes through changes, it unloads. Uh, another good example of a, a, a motor that could change its energy use would be a conveyor. The conveyor is running with no product on it. The conveyor is running with a lot of product on it. And in DC distribution centers, that can change uh, depending on a lot of product going out, month end, whatever, you name it. So how long to measure? Get the full machine cycle. So here's an example of a machine where we got all the phases. And you look at the energy use, and you can see that uh, this is basically one day, just a little longer than one day. 
the machine is not used much. And it's shut down the vast majority of the time. So that's great, but that's one day. Now, I would not take one day from a piece of equipment like this because this was the day before. We managed to get longer intervals, but if you just get a slice, you'd get one picture versus the other picture. This is July 27th. The other one was July 28th. This shows a completely different profile of energy use, what the non-value add states are, which is basically when the um, energy use is around 23 kilowatts and so on. So a completely different understanding of the process. So make sure you get along enough to get all the differences. So one of the things that I advise, especially in the manufacturing environment, is to do some trials with your logger to ensure it's working. Ensure it's getting the data that you want. Um, do a short test. Find out is it the right logger for what you want, maybe the right CT. Um, you're basically at the, the 200 amp range, you're just over it. You thought the 200 amp would work, but you get readings that aren't right. And maybe you're guessed the wrong interval to use. You're seeing some flips and things that you would better capture with a shorter interval. So you might have guessed wrong. Check that. Newer loggers with LCDs will give you feedback to ensure it's working to certain degrees, but it may not give you, did it capture everything you want while you were looking at the LCD? There's nothing worse than realizing you don't have the data you need and you've already flown home. So you really want to be care careful with that. The photo is showing an older style. Boy, this is generations from many moons ago. Um, motor on off logger, which was stuck on the cooling bell fan area of the motor, which does not have any real current associated with it. So it never got any real data. Tip, don't just think of the process. Do all the motors that might make sense. Um, a CNC machine, many of the new uh, you know, icky guys and you name it, they have many motors on them. Uh, some of these motors are tied to the main panel so that when the machine is off, they shut off, but some may not be. So there's an opportunity to think about all the motors. Don't just get one, you might need to think more. And then also think about secondary equipment. You got a process that's tied to a chiller. Process is shut off. Make sure the, sh the chiller is also not operating when it doesn't need to be. Same thing with thermalators or some of the other secondary equipment. Now, motor loggers, be careful about the heat. This is from experience having scorched some loggers and a couple of them don't work anymore because of it motors can get hot. And uh, we almost always use a thermal camera or an infrared thermometer or something to kind of tell us. But this particular motor is 85C or 185F in the middle. You can put a motor on and off logger on that, but I would not put it over the 185 degree F area. I would put it toward the two sides of the machines that are probably less than 100 degrees F. But that can make a big difference. So just think about that and be careful when you put loggers on motors. Uh, if that motor is going to get too hot, you may not have a logger when you return. So other potential issues. you got to think about some of the technology limitations. Here's three motors. They're all about the same size, I think. They're pretty close. And they all have a motor on off uh, logger on them. So the motor loggers all said the three motors are running. That's what the data said. Again, it's just motor runoff. We're not collecting amperage. We're just saying, is there enough electrical field around that motor to be able to say the motor is running? But the thermal camera validates that the middle motor was not on. So you can even put your hand on the motor and you'll feel some vibration from the other two. It's all connected to a cooling loop, but it's not on. The middle logger is actually capturing the electric field from the other ones on the other sides. You gotta understand that and be careful. So are there solutions? Yes. We made a little shielding box. 
but we were shown by onset. So if you have any questions, ask them specifically um, how to change the sensitivity setting on these motor loggers so that it wouldn't be an issue. Change the sensitivity, put it on the middle motor, it's off, the motor logger says it's off, all because we change the sensitivity in the, um, the hoboware. So, before you then take all this data, you've done it right, you figured out your interval and all that stuff, don't automatically dump to Excel. Everybody knows Excel and everybody thinks they're good at Excel, but Hoboware and other software like it is really powerful and flexible. You just don't know it as well as you need to. So go to the YouTube videos from, from Onset or whatever companies and contact their tech support. They can help you cut out literally minutes to hours of stuff you're going to do with Excel. So Hoboware does a good job of merging various things. you got to understand how to do it, various data sets. And um, so just think that you may not need to do this extra step. One of the things we like to do is what we call combined data logging to figure out non-value add. So you see on the motor here on a uh, grinder motor on off logger, uh, the, the motor loading does not change that much. If there's product on the grinder or not, it's not big product. It's not like really a ton of it. And then we put a motion logger to see, and you can see in the bottom photo on the right, to see when there was product going on there. Somebody manually has to walk over and dump it on the conveyor so we could tell. And from all that, we could combine all the data, combine it, and calculate non-value add. What's the savings from doing something smarter? If there's no product on the conveyor, shut her down. So some other things we might do is do lots of combination stuff. This happens to be a piece of HVAC equipment, you know, an RTU. So we'll put a motor state, or we'll use CTs probably on the uh, on a uh, both the motor and also the uh, compressor. But we'll probably use some uh, temperature loggers for supply air, return air, and outside air, so we can calculate amount of outside air uh, that's being used in mixed air temp. I forgot to include that there. Um, so once you do all that, you've got this combination, you've got a logger on the thermostat as I show there, you can see how the systems are all working together or not. So that's just a bunch of stuff about the industrial environment, how to consider things before you go and log the industrial environment, and then um, some of the things to consider. So the first thing I pointed out uh, point it out again is safety. You got to be safe. Um, so really go through those safety slides and make sure that they're okay. Think about any of the concerns with the logging. Putting the logger in the light, right place. Hiding the logger. Will it be near enough to get the data? Uh, think about um, how often you're going to get the data. Is there heat problems with the logger? Um, what process are you going to be logging? Is it going to be a constant motor condition or a variable load motor condition, in which case you may want to consider somehow adjusting for power factor. Think about secondary equipment, not just the primary piece of equipment. In an office environment, it's pretty easy. In an um, industrial environment, many things have secondary ops to them. Um, and remember your objectives. Go back to, I want to achieve this. Time of use amount of use. Think of those two phrases and then define exactly what you mean by both of those things. Then I also suggest doing some checking with the loggers, especially if you're going to have a long deployment, putting the logger on something, leaving it for a week or two. I would routinely check to see that I'm getting the data the right way, the right way that I want it before I leave that logger there for two weeks. And then, you know, hopefully I got everything I need and I'm not surprised and I have to go back. So this is a lot of stuff about the industrial environment and um, we have time for questions at this point. Um, and and um, we did get a question, uh, would he change much on the current measurements? Um, 
I don't know the type of magnets that are used for some of the CTs. Depending on if it's within their tolerable range, it shouldn't impact things tremendously. But that's a great question. Um, so uh, I have another question. Of, do you have any uh, other presentations with more in-depth in discussion of power factor and its importance? Um, I do uh, do some training for the Association of Energy Engineers, and I think that you'll find um, there's some stuff in there that I talk about with power factor. Um, but really, um, quickly on power factor, I went to a presentation at AE conference the other day, and these gentlemen were assuming power factor of 0.85 for compressed air equipment, knowing that the power factor goes down when the compressor unloads and so on. Um, their rule of thumb is if you use 0.8 and you're, you're covering the loading and unloading, you're probably okay in your calculations. You're not perfect and you're not precise, but you're probably okay from a, um, is it the right thing to do or not to change this to a different compressor and so on. Um, this is what I expected. Um, um, well, what training I do for AEE, I have a training session on uh, understanding and using portable data loggers, just like this, but with all the different loggings with, with thermal cameras and back rack meters and all that stuff. We also do um, Energy Kaizen, and uh, we did one of those for onset. So look on their um, website for what we did for them a few years ago. And then we also have done um, um, uh, energy metrics. I do a lot of real in-depth calculations on things, and we train that for AE. Um, do you need to be a licensed electrician to put probes or loggers on the high, high voltage equipment? High voltage. When you say high voltage, if you're defining anything above 480, uh, I think so, but I'm not sure. And the reason I say that is we don't work on anything like 4160 or whatever. We do very seldom with that. And the loggers that have been put on have been by licensed electricians, but I don't know if that was necessity or that's just the company's policy i don't know um, would you need long time intervals of microseconds or milliseconds between events that occur at 10 hertz or faster uh, i don't know that is a very good question um, uh, i i'll have to get back on that that's a great question i don't think so um, because again, what we're talking about is kilowatt hours and, and you know how many hours and boy racking everything up to be an hour from um, milliseconds is uh, that's a lot. Uh, question is, are we training us on the software? No, we are not. There's plenty of very good little training things on the onset uh, website that will um, really help you understand certain things. And we also talked to Onset directly, my staff and I, about some things, and they told us exactly what we were doing and doing right and doing wrong. So, I mean, I would suggest that if you've got their products, call them, ask them. They've always been very good. Um, please touch on the difference between apparent power and displacement power factor while logging VFDs. This isn't brought up. Um, we probably don't have time to bring this up as well. I don't want to get into the whole uh, apparent power and displacement power and true power and all that because it's not enough time on this to do that. Um, uh, how will this PowerPoint presentation be shared? I'm not sure the presentation will be shared. I'll have to leave that to some discussions with Onset. I think the this will be recorded and you can get this through their um, just through their website, look at their recordings and all that stuff. And um, I think that's a good start. Uh, somebody brings up a good point. It's, it's good to note that on-sense equipment is typically only rated to 600 volts. That is, uh, as far as I remember correct, the logging we did at 4160 was with other equipment. That is correct. Um, 
could you put some YouTube videos together for de logger deployment and install training? Uh, I, I certainly could do that. It's just a matter of time and, and everything that's available for that. Um, yeah, um, I, we were just talking about this onset and I, that th there's a lot of really good experience out there. And we, there's going to be so much more data logging, I think, because of all of the, the emphasis on the energy and efficiency and conservation and so on, that there needs to be some better specific with real application training on things. So that's something we were talking about. And I would just say, look back, we might get that at some point. Um, uh, would a customer be able to read the measurements if he wants to? Um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Um, we, we allow customers to do that. In fact, we leave data loggers on site that have LCD displays and they're reading the measurements. So uh, I'm not exactly sure on the intent there. And then we have another comment. Um, Onset should offer training at AEA World Expo and Conference. Um, yeah, and, and I, I think that would be a great thing to do because um, there's just so much you can do with data loggers uh, from onset and others that, that it, it, I, I'm just impressed. Every, every time that we sit down and we're doing another industrial environment or even a municipal environment, we're finding new and unique ways to use these things. Uh, question came up in, in motor data logging, how much inrush current does it, does, how much does inrush current affect the average kilowatt hour readings? Um, negligible in, in, in my um, view. Remember, inrush is exactly that. It's inrush. And we have this discussion all the time with some experienced mature maintenance types who think that because you're turning the motor off and then you're turning it back on, this inrush is going to change your demand um, charges and, and so on. And it's not going to be the case. Remember, we're talking kilowatt hour. That's an hour. And the inrush happens for two, three, four seconds tops. So um, I, I really don't think it's going to have any effect. All right, we have somebody saying, yep, using motor motion on off data logger near motors is uh, something that um, they're going to be doing. And it's, it's really a great thing. Why not tie all the pieces together? Remember, what you want is what's value add and non value add. And with all the little loggers together, you can truly define it. It's probably not one logger that'll give you the best definition of value add. Well, Scott, we've, we've gone through a ton, or um, Sean, we've gone through a ton of questions, and I think we're, um, I've answered most of them. Absolutely. Thank you very much. It, it, we really appreciate you coming out. It's some, uh, some great tips. Uh, by all means, as, as Kevin had mentioned, uh, check out our website. Give our tech support guys a call. Uh, Lots of, especially with our YouTube channel too, we have valuable videos uh, set up, instruction, especially with Hoboware. And like Kevin was saying, there's so much that you can do in that software when it comes to the graphing and analysis portion that you may not know about. So check out the YouTube channel. Uh, I think it's just Onset Data Loggers. If you search that, you'll find that there. Um, and by all means, uh, our website also has videos, white papers. Uh, you'll find, you know, like Kevin mentioned, some of his uh, his other webinars that he's done for us uh, are posted on there. I believe this one will will be as well. But, but thank you again, Kevin. Uh, you're welcome. Everybody, have a good day and happy data logging. <laughs> thank you all.